Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for clicking on this video and for coming back if you're a returning viewer. My name's Laura and I post content about books and a bit about writing and things like that. So if it interests you, then yeah, click the subscribe button. And today I'm going to be talking about um, this book, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. I finished this book about a week ago and I've been like thinking about it a lot and thinking about this my like, kind of trying to gather my thoughts around it and yeah I want to do a little book review and I will note that this video is going to contain spoilers for this book because I'm going to go like into depth like certain things I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, what events were impactful to me, things like that. So if you haven't read this book then maybe click off this video or if you don't mind spoilers and yeah keep watching. I'm currently in Notting Hill which is really fun to film this video. And I'm gonna have a vlog up for my time in London, so if anybody's interested in that, I'll put that in the cards there. And so yeah, that's today's video. And yeah, let's get into it. I'm just gonna read my like description of it that I have here. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow follows two characters, Sadie Green and Sam Mazur, from the time they first meet in a hospital in 1980, where they bond over a shared love of video games and onto their resounding success as video game designers. Throughout the years, they separate and come back together, video games acting as the bridge between them and a language through which they speak their love. It is through their favorite games, as well as the ones they design themselves, that they convey their feelings and struggles, not only to each other, but to the other important people in their lives. It is a novel about love, loss, and friendship, about the different forms that love takes and how it evolves, as well as the kind of connections people develop that last a lifetime. It is a deeply moving novel through which Seven explores the joys and struggles of being an artist and creator, as well as what it means to use art as a way to navigate and understand our lives. Yeah, that's the basic overview of the plot. And the novel sort of opens on a scene set in a train station in near Harvard or Harvard Square. And the main character, Sam, is walking through the station and he's um, struggling to get through. There's this horde of passengers looking at this um, sign, you know, those, I forgot, optical illusion signs where if you stand a certain way or shift or move your eyes a certain way, like it, the image changes. Um, and then there he runs into Sadie Green and they stop and talk and we find out that they've known each other for a long time and then the narrative sort of goes back and shows us how they met how they became friends at the hospital the, um, the way that they use video games to sort of bond and at harvard sadie is there she's studying video game design at mit and um sam is a student at harvard he's in math i think but he's not very like enthralled by what he's doing he doesn't love it he doesn't see a future in it so when he runs into sadie and ends up playing one of her games that she made for her class he convinces her to create a game together and they get uh have an agreement with sam's friend and roommate marks that they will stay in their apart his apartment over the summer and work on this game together and Marx becomes a producer on the game. He ends up staying the summer and helping them with the game and they work to develop what would become their first success, Ishigo. So another thing that I really, really loved about this novel was the way that Seven uses video games as a lens through which to sort of see the characters, but also for the characters to then interpret their emotions and, and to provide their worldview. Their, the lens through which they see the world is very much grounded in video games, which makes sense as people who love video games. and. And they def and who design video games, they would see the world through that perspective. And I thought that was really, really interesting and really well done. There's one point, and this is later on in the novel in the section NPC. And this section was one of my favorite sections, but it's also the most heartbreaking section. This is the part where we find out that Marx, who has since gotten into a relationship with Sadie, and who is like best friends with Sam and he becomes such a pivotal and important character in the novel and you get really, he's a very lovable character. And in this scene, there is a shooting at their offices in California that Mark is a victim of. He gets um, shot and he's in the hospital and then you get this full section told completely from his perspective. And it starts off with this metaphor of him being a bird and flying and then you find out that and as the reader that this the shifting timeline means that like a lot of the time you're still trying to piece things together and in this section you're really trying to piece together what happens to marks you know something's happening at other offices but you don't know what happens to each character you don't know what's going to happen to marks 
and you get the sense that he's been shot and you're getting his perspective and it's like he's lucid even as he's in this coma, this medically induced coma. But there's one point where he's talking about um, what an NPC is and he's talking about the moment that Sam found out that um, Marks and Sadie were in a relationship together and throughout the novel Sam and Sadie have this really deep friendship and really deep connection and there's this feeling that they could have this romantic connection but for whatever reason maybe they each have their own reasons that never develops into more they never try to make it develop into more but when Sam finds out about the two of them he takes it really really like hard and there's this one moment where Sam is angry at Marx about this relationship and he's been drinking and Marx has come to his like hotel room to try and you know help him and pretty much put him to bed and just yeah talk about it and Sam confronts Marx and calls Marx an NPC as an insult and it says an NPC is a character that is not playable by a gamer it is an AI extra it gives a program world verisimilitude the NPC can be a best friend, a talking computer, a child, a parent, a lover, a robot, a gruff tune leader, or the villain. Sam, however, means this as an insult. In addition to calling you unimportant, he's saying you're boring and predictable. The fact is, there's no game without the NPCs. And I, I think she does a really good job of making this accessible. It's not like, her, the video game references aren't at all alienating to the reader. If you're not someone who plays a lot of video games, you can still understand the terms. She does a very good job of, of describing everything without giving too much detail but just enough that you, you're along for the ride with them you feel like you, you you're not taken out of the story at all by this and i thought that was really really well done the other thing i loved was that i guess as someone who reads a lot of romance novels and who loves the romance subplot and things like that i went into this novel expecting there to be some sort of romantic connection between sadie and sam and i thought that over time it, that would their friendship would lead to that that was at least the impression I got from the blurb, but that never happens. Instead, we have this sort of exploration of a platonic relationship and platonic love and the way that shifts and change over time. And instead of being disappointed by the lack of romance, I actually really, really love that it wasn't turned into a romantic relationship. I love that it stayed platonic. I feel like I read so many books where the main two characters are, end up in romantic relationships with each other, but um, not a lot of books champion like the importance and power of platonic love and friendship. It, it, it kind of is making the point that like well that they don't need to have this sort of romantic relationship to have this lifelong enduring connection with each other yeah and even though there are times when the relationship is strained even there's a period in the novel where they don't talk for many years that they keep coming back to each other and they use video games as a way to reconnect which i think was really lovely um, and this happens primarily in another section of the novel which happens this is after marx's death and sadie has a child with marx um, but she's, she's kind of, she's struggled, of course, to recover from this event that's happened and, and to get back to work and she ends up moving away and she doesn't maintain her relationship with Sam. She sort of, she wants Sam to leave her alone. She, she they've had a strange relationship for a while at this point, but this sort of pushes it over the edge. And there's a scene, a uh, section called Pioneers, which sort of is told through the perspective of Sadie's video game character and you follow the character as it makes its way through this, um, digital world that Sam, you find out, has created to help Sadie heal and to, to deal with um, Marx's death, but also as a way for them to connect. And they play these two characters that end up being married in this video game, and and then it ends when Sadie finds out that that is Sam, but she doesn't know that a part of her knew it was him the whole time, but um, she just wasn't ready to like accept that that was what he was doing. She feels a bit manipulated by this. like. The, the fact that he made a whole game for her even though yeah that's just her perspective on it the one thing i found about this section was i thought it was really cool to see it like a video game perspective but i don't know I, I didn't i think at first i didn't really understand why i was in the video game i thought it was a bit slow like that was the only part of the novel that i didn't feel as like entranced by i thought it was just it didn't move on at a quick pace and i was I was starting to see the connection the more I got into it and then especially by the end but I found like especially since it was the second last section I felt it was just a bit too slow so that was the only part that I wasn't as keen on and of course this book is just so much sadder than I thought it would be I didn't think it made me tear up multiple times which I was not expecting just yeah what happens to Marx is so sad and there's this really great moment in the novel where 
you find out the way that the way it's not just Sam but also Sadie uses video games as a way to deal with her grief and to process her grief about Marx and there's this game that Sadie had made just before Marx's death and she was working on an expansion pack of the game and in this expansion pack she includes this scene where there's Marx, this Asian American character and is performing on the stage for an effect and this is tied back to Marx because Marx was a uh, in theater in college and it was his dream to play the lead role in Macbeth but when his school did the production he was still a freshman and so he was he paid Banquo because he wasn't you know he wasn't he was too new to the theater to get the leading role and then there's a point where he talks about how he the moment he decided not to pursue acting was when he realized he would never get the leading role or never get the roles he wanted because of his Asian descent. There's this scene that she has where she inserts him as a character um, and Sam at, for a long time can't play the game because it's just too emotional for him. He doesn't realize that, that she's done this. He just, he just, he has this tense relationship with her and he just for the longest time doesn't play the game. But then someone shows him this part of the game and it says, on stage in the middle of white Elizabethan England and probably stands a handsome Asian man as Macbeth. Macbeth has just heard the news that his wife had died and he's giving the most famous soliloquy from the play, the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech. I just love that moment in the novel where like, I didn't necessarily know that that's what the title was referencing. And then I just love when the title like appears in the novel and you finally have that like, oh, like full circle moment when you figure out exactly what it's talking about or what, what the title comes from. Um, and then it's sort of the narrative sort of shifts back in time to show the scene where Marx and them are in university still. And like this made me tear up, but they're in university and he is trying to convince them to name their um, gaming company after this speech. He wants them to name it Tomorrow Games, which Sadie and Marx don't like. They think it's too soft, but Marx explains that it's this famous um, speech from Shakespeare. And it says, to make his case, Marx jumped up on a kitchen chair and recited the tomorrow speech for them, which he knew by heart. And then later, as he's still trying to convince them, Marx says, what is the game? Marx said, it's tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. It's the possibility of infinite rebirth, infinite redemption. The idea if you keep playing, you could win. No loss is permanent because nothing is permanent ever. Yeah, that's just another instance in which Marx sort of uses video games as a way to interpret the world and to see his place in the world. And there's a scene in NPC when Marx becomes aware that he's gonna die. And he says, some hours, days, or weeks later, you're listening to a doctor tell your mother and father in an outrageously serene voice that you, Marx, would wanna be citizen of the world or going to die. You are a gaming person, which is to say you're the kind of person who believes that game over is a construction. The game is only over if you stop playing. There is always one more life. Even the most brutal death isn't final. You could have taken poison, fallen into a vat of acid, been decapitated, been shot a hundred times, and still, if you click restart, you could begin it all over again. Next time you will get it right, next time you might even win. So it's just another example of the way that Sagan uses video games as, as this sort of thread that connects every element of the novel together, because she explores so many different themes and so many different topics. And there's this, so many different relationships in the time loop period moves around a lot and you're jumping forward and back in time and the one thing that sort of connects all of these elements together is this video games and this love of video games and the way we use video games but not just video games but also art and any form as people to sort of view the world and to interpret the world and to connect with other people which I thought was lovely. As we reach the conclusion of the novel I feel like there's this one moment after Sam has watched this game where sort of Marx gets to play this character from Beth and give the tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow speech where he's thinking about Marx and it, I feel like it just like a per quote perfectly wraps up what the novel was about and what the novel was trying to say. So it goes, sitting at his desk, Sam could not quite identify what scene Marx and Sadie's game had made him feel. Not just pain or sadness or happiness or nostalgia or longing or love, but touched him the most was the sound of Sadie's voice, untouched and clarion, speaking to him through a game across time and space. Others, like Charlotte Worth, might recognize Marx in the sequence, but Sadie was speaking to Sam. After a long silence, he could hear her voice again and he determined that what he felt was hope. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Um, I might do like my favorite parts, my, like my least favorite things about it. So my favorite things about it were the way that it uses video games throughout the novel as a sort of 
um, way to describe emotions and character and, and relationships. I thought that was really great and really ties in well with what this novel is about. Um, I love the characters. I love the relationships and the relationship dynamics. I love the sort of um, non-chronological timeline and I thought it was used very well in this book. And I loved that it explores art and creation as a theme and explores social topics and it has sort of social commentary running throughout about America at that time and today and I think that's really great and it was really well done. And then least favorite things. Um, the only thing I just didn't like about it was the pioneer section wasn't my favorite. Not that I thought it was bad or that it didn't, like I, I thought it did work in the novel, but I just thought it was a bit slow and I think it, it took me out of the novel a bit at the end, especially for where it was placed in the story. I think it was just too close to the end and I just wanted to figure out what was gonna happen. I felt like it was sort of, I don't know, it was just too slow for me at that moment. And this is a book that I gave five stars and I'm so glad that I read it. Um, and yeah, I'd love to know what you guys thought of this book if you've read it. So comment down below your thoughts. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I'll be doing more review videos and sort of, yeah, trying more to, yeah, do that style of video for you guys if you guys enjoyed it. And yeah, so thanks for watching. If you're interested in following me elsewhere and seeing more bookish content from me, I have an Instagram and a TikTok that I'll put on the screen. I'll have the links to down below. And yeah, I post videos every Tuesday and Friday. So subscribe if you want to stay tuned for all those and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.